Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our next session. Uh, so my name is John Butler. I'm uh, the Global Lead for Energy Transition with Global Maritime, and uh, happy to be chairing this session. So today we're going to be looking at powering the diversified energy ecosystem. Uh, so to set a bit of a context and scene for this, I guess uh, it's a really important area that we're in when you think about the context of the UKCS, and, uh, and, and really in energy systems within Europe. Uh, for the last 50 to 60 years, uh, the UK continental shelf has been dominated by oil and gas uh, as its primary energy source. And over the last 20 years, what you've found is an increasing uh, amount of, of alternative energy uh, sources coming through. And, uh, and really what, as this is accelerating and increasing over the last couple of decades, you're seeing a more diverse energy mix. So when I think about you know, so my career, uh, even up to five, 10 years ago, when you're thinking about uh, the, um, uh, the oil and gas industry in the UK, you're thinking about uh, the UK as being a mature um, energy basin. And really what was gonna happen next was decommissioning and cessation of, uh, of any sort of energy sources. Uh, now when you look at it, in some respects, it's actually been rejuvenated and, uh, and reinvigorated. But uh, as, as you know, we're kind of moving away and, uh, and you know, sort of uh, depleting the amount of oil and gas that's available in this basin, it's actually increasing the amount of alternative energy, including uh, renewables, tidal, wind, uh, hydrogen. Uh, that's also built into geothermal, uh, CCUS for carbon capture and storage and, and utilization. So really what you're doing is you're creating this, this uh, diverse aspect of, uh, of the energy ecosystem now. And this all needs companies, it needs engineering, it needs data, and, uh, and it needs those innovative solutions. So I'm delighted uh, to have a panel with me here today that really know this very clearly and very succinctly. So I'll go to them in a minute for them to introduce themselves. Uh, but really, what I really want to do here is, uh, is talk about you know, sort of, uh, the systems and how the types of projects that can be delivered and how we're using them. And then really, ultimately, how data will fit into that as well. And it's an important aspect to remember that as we move into this alternative energy space and, uh, and energy diversity, that uh, it's the acceleration and the proliferation of technology and data that's really going to drive these things. When I think about energy transition as a, as a, um, as a concept, it's often described as uh, the three Ds. So it's uh, decarbonize, decentralize, and digitize. So that's kind of the, the real nucleus of what we're discussing today. But to start off with, I'm gonna let the panel introduce themselves. And uh, over to you, Tom. Tom Brown, I'm the engineering manager um, at Simply Blue Energy for the Salamander project. Um, I think uh, I represent that diversification quite well, uh, having an oil and gas background, um, but then moving over through to, um, to renewables. So. Yeah, hi, I'm Paul Slorich. I'm the Business Development Director with Verloom. Uh, Verloom, up until about well, maybe two months ago, was known as ECOG. Um, our focus is on energy management and energy storage technologies. Yep, Scott Hamilton. I'm the head of offshore renewables for Exodus. We're a global energy consultancy, but I look after the part that does offshore wind. We mostly focus upon floating offshore wind, brand new projects, and local content. The the process of enabling a new industry and new markets. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Ian Thomas. I'm a senior principal uh, consultant with um, Vices. And vices were actually carved out of Loud Register um, 18 months, two years ago. Uh, my background, I guess, is environment and uh, regulatory assurance. And my focus will be uh, governance and assurance around data. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Right. We've got the mics working now as well, which is good. Seems to have everybody perfectly. So uh, I guess to start off with, Scott, I'm going to go to yourself. And when we're looking at this diverse energy eco uh, sphere that we have now at the moment, from the experience that you're seeing uh, from, uh, from this early stage works, like, you know, are you, where are you seeing uh, blockers or constraints in achieving the ambitions that, that have really been driven by the targets that have been set by things like Scott Wind and Crown Estate? So I think there's probably two, two 
threads that you can pick up on that one. One is the, the timeline piece, in that we have some very aggressive targets on how we want to get to net zero, both through pure play offshore wind projects, through the likes of Scotland, round four, and then also for the electrification of the North Sea Basin. We need that those electrons to be on the grid as soon as possible, but at the same time, there's a planning process that takes you know up to 10 years, and that's if it's relatively straightforward. So that is difficult to get around, particularly on the electrification side, when you're trying to match that around the, the brownfield assets that are out there at the moment and their life expectancy, trying to align those and then have the remaining life in those assets to have something that will be able to pay the bills essentially and, and give the, the financial security of the route to market for, for the 15 years or so that's required is a challenge. So trying to work with the regulators to condense that and bring that down to something much more manageable. The other thread being the push for local content. I mean, that's something we really focus on, have a USP, we do it here, we do it in the US, we're picking it up in Japan and Australia as well. It's, it's something I do believe strongly in. But you're fighting an uphill battle there because we, we are not at the heart of it, a manufacturing economy. The UK hasn't really made things since the 1980s. So to suddenly say, we, we don't make anything and now we need to make specifically jackets and we need to make hundreds of them at a time or we need to make wind turbines and we need to make thousands of those over the next few years. It's a real pivot. And I think that's one of the things that's not really understood in the, um, I guess, the, the wider public knowledge or uh, the public sphere is that you can't just ex expect people to pick up some tools and make things. That's a gradual process. There has to be investment and upskilling and learning. And we need to go through this trajectory of, of making things again. We need to re-industrialize as a, a nation before we can then start saying, now we can make these cheaper than say the likes of South Korea. The South Korean example is, is something to really be held up as a, a shining example in terms of you take an island and you invest in it to the point whereby you ship in any raw material you want, you put it through a process and on the other side, out comes whatever it is you require. Is that a ship? Is that a car? Is that piles and piles of fo floating foundations? It's all there and it can all be done because they have decades of experience in that now. And for us to really get to that stage, we have to understand that there's a 30 year journey there. It's not just the next eight years, all of a sudden, click your fingers and we can be in that point. So it's trying to align those expectations and make sure nobody's sitting on their hands and just expecting this to happen. There's got to be a lot of signposting going on to ensure that once we get through that challenging and consenting process, we are then also ready and willing with the, the um, supply chain enabled to create as much as possible at a national level within the UK. So it's those two things aligning, really. Gotcha. And I guess it's really interesting context because, like, when you think about it, you're trying to uh, develop a, um, I guess, a supply chain that is evolved enough to be able to meet the requirements for the industry, but uh, but also do that economic economic price point that allows your levelised cost of energy to be suitable for for the, the region, the area. Absolutely, and that's one of the things that kind of has come out of the CFD process. It's been brilliant for driving down cost within the offshore wind industry, and it has um, made the financing so much easier because it aligns so well with there and de-risks that process for the banks. But at the same time, that race to the bottom on price leaves nothing left for investment in the wider industry. So the if you can push somebody as much as you want to invest into a local economy and build facilities, but if the process by which they fund the project doesn't allow them any space to make those investments, then it's a chicken and the egg one. And once you get to a project finance stage, the only thing that is important to you is the success of your particular project. You're no longer thinking at an industry level about how does this benefit the next project and the next one. The levers you have are your project levers. And the only things you, you can really focus on is your project success. So it's a matter of engaging early in that process so that people can make these decisions at a corporate level before it gets to a project level and then those constraints come in. Excellent. Okay. And so I guess uh, if we build on that theme then, and uh, I guess someone we come to yourself, we, you know, as uh, Simply Blue Group, uh, developing a number of offshore floating wind projects in around the UK and Ireland. So I guess, are you seeing that uh, you notice a wider embracement of, um, of alternative energy in the maritime sector? Yes, certainly. Can everyone hear me? There we go. Um, yes, certainly we have um, noticed a wider embrace of alternative, although um, John, you know, you're goading me here a little bit. Um, I don't really like that term, alternative. I think it's a bit outdated. Um, so we've had fixed wind in, in the 
the UK for, for decades now. It, it's not an alternative. Um, but uh, the areas that you know you could still consider alternatives, the fringe on that is, is floating, whereby the technology is still coming through. The um, there's a, a constant stream of new foundation ideas, um, and it's going to be a while before the, the ones that you know you know really have the weight behind them come through. Uh, and it's only at that point that we'll be able to talk about floating as, as not being alternative, although. Um, yeah, as I say, I do struggle with that term alternative. Um, the other, you know, Simply Blue are really, I think, do, um, as, you, as you can see from the slide behind me, um, the three areas we're operating, floating wind, wave, and, and aquaculture, are really uh, uh, a picture of the diverse blue economy that I think we, we need to be working towards. Um, and out of that, obviously, like, the wave energy is still quite alternative. Um, it's on a much longer technology development arc than uh, floating wind. Um, but then we shouldn't really be, think, um, be, be missing um, the sustainable aqu aquaculture either. Um, it's not so much energy, but it's, uh, it's nutrition, um, you know, both our salmon farming um, and our kelp farming as well. So you know, that's really like how Simply Blue are addressing the diversity issue with, uh, with the blue economy. Um, and then outside of Simply Blue, I'd say I, I have seen this wider acceptance from the supply chain. So we engage on a regular basis within the Salamander project, at least, um, with the supply chain. Uh, we're constantly looking for innovations and we have a phased approach. We've, we've just finished our first phase. And we've had a great response and a, a huge number of innovations. Um, and it is very clear that um, only a small percentage of those innovations come from companies who are only looking at one particular sector. Um, all of them are, are very diverse uh, in their offering and in their backgrounds as well. So yeah, I, I absolutely have found that there is a wider embrace within the maritime sector. Yeah. Excellent. And I think it's, a, it's an important aspect as well when you particularly focus on that blue economy aspect. And uh, we heard it like this morning when people were talking about that area as well. And I think it's a very key aspect to think about, particularly in, you know, sort of whether it's energy or any marine based, you know, sort of uh, economic growth, uh, effectively developing uh, that sort of wealth from, uh, from the ocean. And, uh, you know, blue economy really allows us to, uh, I think, break down some of those barriers. And when you widen that out, whether it be between uh, renewable energy, uh, offshore floating wind, uh, oil and gas, aquaculture, it's about breaking down these barriers. And in some respects, the, the data is the things that allows the commonality between all those areas and, uh, and can be a leveler or, you know, sort of a normalizer when you're looking to try and find those, those common areas. But um, so I guess we've, we've touched on the, the sort of you know sort of development uh, and and the types of of, uh, of use of, of uh, different types of technology. So you, you've got this electricity, then you need to store it. So I guess I'm going to come to yourself, uh, Paul, really, and now you know think about these multiple streams of renewable energy, and uh, and as they come out, when we talk about renewables, we often talk about curtailment, and uh, and then it's really about how do we manage that curtailment, and a lot of that is developed through storage. So I guess can you take us through a little bit of, of uh, I guess the work that you've been doing. Yeah, certainly, John. Um, I guess we would sort of class ourselves as a technology company and myself probably as a technologist and the focus there is on energy storage. I guess to touch on a couple of things, I was, I was here yesterday for a different seminar. It was the OE UK Electrification in the Making seminar, which was really focused on electrification of the UK continental shelf. And some of the numbers, I may have got these wrong, memory's not that great, but um, 20, Scotland is what, 26 gigawatts? Um, the UK grid, or the Scottish grid, sorry, can only take 8 to 10 gigawatts. Intog itself is another 8 gigawatts. And the uh, overall sort of power demand of the UK North Sea is about 10 gigawatts, something like that. So those numbers don't stack up, really. When you look at peak demand, you have to have some form of energy storage to look at that from a systems perspective. And to touch on the earlier session on, on training, there's a lot of commonalities there between, you know, oil and gas projects and this sort of wider electrification scope and that, you know, it's a systems level conversation. It's all well and good to speak about spe specific technologies, fixed floating wind, wave power, tidal energy, but you need to look at it from a systems perspective to make it sort of work. And energy storage is a key part of that. Um, so our focus is on 
battery storage, and that works well for you know some short duration applications or low power applications, um, or I guess niche sort of non utility scale applications. But <laughs> equally, the, the still commonalities in the sort of management of those systems and the and, and the integration of all that um, across the longer duration energy storage and the far bigger um, needs of sort of utility scale or platform scale uh, power generation. Um, so the technology needs um, and, and the integration of all that uh, is certainly something that needs very careful consideration, I would say. And again, it comes back to this element where it's about, you know, sort of uh, using diversified technology in order to be able to help streamline sort of um, a, a different type of energy compared to, you know, what's traditionally been done in the, in the UKCS. Uh, so again, it's you know, I guess often we talk about there's, there's no uh, silver bullet for decarbonisation, but really what we're trying to do is, you know, so it's, it's numerous silver bullets and, uh, and the storage aspect comes into that as well. And, and I guess, you know, you, you can't talk about storage, particularly in, in the context of what we are doing without talking about hydrogen. And uh, I guess that becomes into one of those other energy vectors that is, you know, I guess it's uh, often heralded uh, and we're seeing lots of developments again, as touched on this morning, uh, about, you know, I think it's Aberdeen is one of the largest uh, hydrogen-enabled cities for transportation with the number of buses that we have. And uh, I know for a fact that uh, the only two hydrogen refueling stations in Scotland are both in Aberdeen. Uh, so, you know, I guess th there's already um, a, a basis for that. But again, so I'll just open up to the panel. Um, it, you know, how do you see sort of uh, that hydrogen solution coming in? And do you see that connected with, uh, with you know, sort of offshore renewables? Anyone want to jump in there? You're asking me <laughs> directly? Um, you can go for that. Sorry, I think you better ask that one again. Oh, sorry. So it's really just, I guess, where do we see the, the potential for hydrogen uh, within this as, as, a, as an overall storage medium? You know, because I guess we often I talk about uh, particularly blue hydrogen and green hydrogen from renewables. I mean, the, the, I, mean the, the, I guess the, the debate, the jury's still open now, isn't it? It's, uh, Green hydrogen, blue hydrogen, yeah, it's, it, versus uh, electri electrification, it, it, it's completely, completely open at the minute. I guess. I think one of the things we are finding on on the, the hydrogen question itself is that one, the interest has really increased over the past few years, ever since the majors got involved in in the offshore wind industry. You know, there's a certain element of being comfortable with molecules over electrons and pulling things back to a standard business model. Um, and, and hydrogen is, is ideal for that. It gets us back to that point of having a storage capability from electrons rather than either being wasted or just switching stuff off and wasting essentially good wind <laughs> that could be generated one way or the other. And when, you, when you're trying to displace the old way of doing business, it's quite good as that transition space there. But a lot of the focus is, is being made on how do we do that initial transfer process from electron, electrons to, to hydrogen and do we do that offshore, do we do that at each turbine unit, do we do it onshore at one centralised piece. But until we actually answer the, the demand side question, as in how much hydrogen is required and how are we going to interface that with the system, you know, are we at 2% or 20% within the, the heat network, are we going to have hydrogen cars or are they too small and it's all going to be hydrogen trains and or lorries and, and these sorts of things, then you can't set a price for hydrogen. And that makes it incredibly hard for guys to know how to invest into the, the whole process overall. So there's, there's the willingness that is there, but the route to market is unclear. And I, I think under standard process, you know, we'd still be at a, a very much an R&D phase on, on hydrogen at the moment, but with the real push towards a green economy in general and this transition piece, there's been a lot more focus on finance entering that hydrogen market than there normally would be this early on. So it's, there's a lot of heat there. <laughs> and I'm just wary of a hydrogen bubble, which as we all know, uh, hydrogen being particularly volatile is quite dangerous, <laughs> particularly when dealing with offshore. So I think it's, it's those things needing to align. And what we really need is a clear steer, not just government level, but at EU and, and international level around where are we going with this hydrogen economy? That needs to be mapped out. And then the rest of that can start to come together around how is it most effectively used for things like offshore wind um, or, or solar, etc. I think this is uh, where some of our skills come in with the um, on the assurance of numbers. So if you are going to be trading uh, hydrogen molecules or, or, or carbon uh, molecules, well, 
those numbers that are traded need need to be verifiable numbers. So where where did they come from? So yeah, the, 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 there's there's a lot of work to be done there. Absolutely. And someone just out there from Salaman because we've recently made a decision. Um, so throughout the project, we've had both options on the table, whether to export electrons or, or hydrogen. And we've recently taken the decision that we are going to go down the electron route and we're going to ditch hydrogen. Um, and as a previous riser engineer, I was a bit sad to hear that, <laughs> um, but never mind. Um, but the, the reasons were what you laid out there, Scott, absolutely. Like we don't have, or the route to market for hydrogen for us was, was not clear. You know, we we had we'd have trouble finding an offload, and there was a lot of risk in that. And it wasn't something that, at, at this stage and at this project, we were willing to take forward. But those, those electrons can still be used to generate hydrogen, just you know, further downstream. You know, it, it doesn't. It, it still needs use cases. Um, I think you know, there's a lot of to touch on the strategy piece. There's been a lot of good work done by you know, companies, organisations like NZTC which Exodus, I'm sure we're involved in some of that yeah. stuff. It, and and it, it's quite aspirational, I suppose, but it's almost like a sort of build it and they will come mentality, certainly. Can we create an economy around it? But the technologies have to be in place and it takes a long time mm. to develop that and raise the TRL um, to a place where it can be economical. But it, it almost, to a certain extent, it depends what you want to do. Um, you know, from an energy storage perspective, hydrogen is very good for long duration storage, you know, you, you, you store hydrogen in tanks and it won't change phase, it won't change state um, when it's managed correctly, obviously. Um, and that works well, that can be really cost effective with the preliminary numbers that we have. It doesn't work so well on the smaller scale as we know. I mean, a, an EV hasn't had the same, or a hydrogen vehicle hasn't had the same level of investment as an electric car in terms of that technology development. And there's, that's shown in the cost of the vehicles, they're still, you know, really expensive, but it, I think it will come. You know, I think I think hydrogen is a valid, um, a valid. You know, is well, is a valid storage medium. We know that it's proven, um, but it seems to be a valid investment piece. I think uh, for Scotland, for the local economy, um, to, to 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 I guess help with this sort of overall diversification. No, absolutely. I think it's uh, I think it's important, particularly when we're at this almost early stage in some respects, and seeing where what these different types of energy vectors are looking like and uh, get your thoughts on it, so that's, that's really appreciated. So I suppose if we bring it back a little bit uh, to the data again, and uh, I guess uh, probably Paul, uh, um, uh, or sorry, Ian, more of a question for yourself. I guess uh, at the moment, you know, like we talked about all day, data is king, and, uh, and it comes into the performance and driving efficiency in order to build out smarter solutions. And, um, but obviously, you know, so if it's about acquiring more and more data and then how we use uh, this data to improve execution. So I guess, you know, from your perspective, how are you seeing sort of data landscapes and, and, and the requirements and stakeholders in that area? I'll give you a slide to help you. Right, yeah, go. I tried to uh, declutter the slide as best as I could. <laughs> but data, um, what exactly are we talking about here? It comes in all shapes and sizes. Um, I was quite interested to see early on uh, earlier on uh, this afternoon, there was a, a, a data landscape slide up there. Uh, I was actually going to use that; it would have been embarrassing if it, <laughs> if it had. But but it actually shows that we were, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at the same items. We're, we're, we're aligned here. So um, when you're talking about um, permitting, regulatory compliance, or you're talking about financing, somebody needs to have data from somewhere so they can make their decisions. But you know. Uh, make the decisions to um, to progress their, their projects, to progress the investment. So whether that's to get, you know, to, to, to progress the uh, a, a new development or even um, refine an, an, an existing development, data needs to be there. So we've, I guess we, we've been um, working with uh, data assurance, verification, and certification, I guess, back through the days of Lloyd Register, LRQA. Um, I mean, the ETS has been about, I saw from one of Boris's um, uh, reports the other day, since 2002. So I thought, we've been doing it that long, 2002. Emissions verification. And that was that was back 20 years ago, but we're, we're back here doing it again. So the stuff that you can see up here on the left, this is some work that we did in, in, in the Middle East with uh, onshore drilling contractors, offshore drilling contractors, and refineries. 
And to get to the numbers that these guys are reporting for stock market purposes, as opposed to uh, regulatory purposes, they need to have a you know verifiable number. You, you would think that was dead easy to do, but where do they get the data from? What are the assumptions that that you know? What what about the metering? So the materiality, the uncertainty, calibration, all of this stuff. It it all needs to go into the mix. In fact, the one. I mean, just to show you how bizarre things can get, we did an ITT for somebody. Um, they, they claim to have something like 40 rigs. At the end of the day, they ended up fighting over a number of nine rigs. <laughs> so before we even try to calculate the CO2, let's just set the boundaries and work out what, how many rigs you've got. So that, that's what all goes into verifying a number. And yeah, it's really important. And you can see on the right-hand slide, um, the, the right-hand side over there, you can see you know, the build-up EIA, BAT assessments, all of this kind of stuff. So this, this is all what's needed to um, demonstrate to the regulator or your investors that your claims are as they should be. So there's a lot that goes into it. And, uh, so I suppose when it comes back to, yeah. again, we're looking at those diversified energy solutions, you're, there's an element where you're kind of, you know, sort of uh, recognizing and verifying yeah. uh, what the impact is on that and, yeah. uh, and, and how it's been used. Yeah, and, and, and the one, I've, I put a little diagram at the side there. The last thing you should ever do is pick up the calculator to do your <laughs> calculations. That is the last thing. To give you a little example, um, we were doing financial assurance for uh, oil spill down in Australia. We, we actually verified, we've heard a lot about models today, but we verified the APR model um, for, for um, oil, oil spills, a Macondo type oil spill. How much would it cost you to clean that up? Well, to work that out, you need to work out how many vessels do you need? You know, how long is it going to take to do the relief well? There's a ton of stuff you need to actually do before you can do the calculation. And our experience at the time was, um, well, people people just completely underestimated all of that. So yeah, interesting stuff to us. And I guess when you looked at it, so you know, this conversation we just had here, like you know, we, we've we've transversed from you know, sort of uh, regulatory data, uh, renewables, storage, hydrogen. You know, we can go on. We can talk about geothermal, CCUS, and uh, I guess for me, one of the interesting aspects when we talk about energy transition, and again, going back to this morning, I think it is one of those words that is getting overused now. Uh, but sometimes when people are trying to imagine what energy transition is to them, they imagine it like a, like a like a department in their office. When the reality is, it's basically about using your same skills in different ways. And uh, to Neil Brady's point, I think the last session, although it was quite uh, interesting how they're using their sort of top sides um, uh, mods guys to, to design you know, uh, systems for battery storage onshore, you know, uh, realizing that they've got the same skill sets. In fact, in some respects, maybe it's easier because you don't have to marinize it or you don't have to put it on water. Um, but I, so I wanted to kind of delve into that skills element a little bit. You know, so uh, I guess a lot of the panel, um, you know, predominantly, myself included, kind of almost come from that uh, either marine or oil and gas sort of background. So from a skills perspective, uh, how do you see that from the projects that are happening, from the work that you're doing? Uh, what's your interpretation of skills? We, we heard it from a, not a theoretical and our academic perspective, but I wanted to hear from your perspectives where you see it happening right now. Here. Here um, well, so, uh, yeah, it stems off our previous topic quite quite nicely there. Um, my, myself, um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I was in oil and gas for, for quite a while before I moved over to Vestas. Um, and luckily for me, my, my skill set was recognized as being transferable. And I think that there's a lot of situations where people aren't recognizing that their skills are transferable. Um, and that's that's holding them back there. Um, so, sorry, I've forgotten your question, John, specifically. Was no, so I guess your interpretation of like, you know, basically the, the reuse of those skills and uh, and how you see uh, transferable skills from other industries, whether it be oil and gas or well, yeah, yeah, actually to stem further off that, um, within our own team within Salamander, there's, a, well, there's a diverse set of skills from, um, from everyone. Um, but a, a lot of our technical staff have, including myself, have come from an oil and gas background. Um, one of our key engineers has um, his 
uh, experience in oil and gas can be measured in decades and as, as experience in offshore wind can be measured in um, months, he likes to say. So, but um, it, yeah, it doesn't mean he's any less valuable to the team. In fact, you know, that, that experience is something that we absolutely need. Yeah. Yep. Well, I'll come in on that, John. Do you want to go back to my side there? Actually, there's a couple of things Surely. to touch on. So, down, um, down at the bottom there, the bottom two images, that's two wave power projects that we're currently working on, upcoming sea trials. Essentially, we're building, Verluma building, um, seabed battery storage systems for non utility scale applications, basically creating offshore microgrids using wave power to power uh, subsea. Um, facilities, whether it's production control applications, residential subsea vehicles, sensor packages, doesn't really matter. But what you have there is a, is a seabed battery storage system. Within that, the, the, the energy storage is very similar to what you would see in a typical EV. So our business now comprises um, some technical staff which come from um, oil and gas applications. You know, my background is designing trees and wellheads, and then I moved into designing pipes to house batteries. And then we have some other guys that have come in from the EV sector that are now working in underwater applications, which is completely diverse to what they ever thought they would be doing unless you're doing something for a James Bond film. So it's, it, it's, you've got this core, these core skills sort of overlapping um, to create uh, sort of new innovative products. And if you look at those projects specifically, to go back to the data thing, you know, you've got a, a wave power application or, or a wave power system and a seabed battery storage system. And, and crucially there, what you need is energy security, reliable energy supply for the types of assets that we're looking at. And that's a modeling capability. So taking Metocean data for a specific site, um, how much uh, energy is available, how much storage is needed to give uh, security of supply to that particular asset, and then creating the control system um, that manages all of that. So all those uh, the, sort of the modeling capabilities and the analysis and the uh, the, uh, the controls, architecture, the software, the firmware, the PCBs, you know, that's all transferable skills from, from oil and gas and, or other parts of, you know, technology development. For my part, I think on the, um, the physical skills piece, you know, Exus has been around for 15 years, largely focused on the oil and gas sector. So we've, we've been doing this and we are experts in that space. And it's been in the last three years that we've really focused on offshore wind as well. And it, I, me personally, I've, I've always been in the offshore wind space, but my career has always drifted alongside the oil and gas side of things. So I've had familiarity with both sides, but it's taken the last few years for me to really understand the difference between the two. And when it comes down to transferring those skills, I think as much as anything, it's about the context and teaching people that context of the two things. Because in, in oil and gas, a lot of the, um, the engineering that, that goes into designing some of these things, particularly a, a whole platform, it's, it's far more detailed and involved and, and dangerous to some extent than it is in the offshore wind sector. So, you know, you could always look at the design process of one of these and go, well, if I can do that, I can obviously do that when you're looking at a very simple jacket structure for putting in 40 meters of water or something like that. And at the actual kind of baseline level, yes, if you can do that task, you can do that one, but you're going from a design process over here in oil and gas where you've essentially got a bottomless pit of equity funds in order to go through that design process to build that out and to do it exactly the way that is correct for that job in the safest possible way because you know once you take that out you install it and you drill down that's going to start pouring buckets of cash back at you and the repayment piece is largely not even considered because it will always pay back more than it costs to build and design in offshore wind it's a much smaller process in terms of, you know, we've got to design this in exactly the right way because we are dealing with a finite pot of debt, which must be paid bank back. And those banks must be absolutely certain that they will get their cash back. They're not as bothered about how much things cost, but the certainty and the risk around those repayments is always there from the start. That is what they are concerned about. So you go from, from that process to let's design this exactly right for the task that's required, but we also have to be able to do it a hundred times so it's, it's getting through that mindset piece between the two to really understand the context. And it's, it, it took me, like I say, a good two years to really understand what the differential was there because the skills themselves and running the calculations and these sort of things are, are all in the right places. And it, it's just getting that mindset piece slightly different to then look at what you're actually answering when it comes down to the question on the table. It's, it's not how do I build this thing, it's how do I build it for the market that's required. Can you just clarify what Scott, against why the... For oil and gas installation, it's it's based on equity, and for offshore wind, it's based on debt. Is that purely because, I guess, margins? 
Yeah, um, to some extent, you know, debt is cheaper than equity, um, but uh, <laughs> debt has to be repaid. And, and because this is more, much more of an infrastructure and you have a defined um, revenue stream on the other side, it's the, the bank finance is therefore available at very, very low levels. It has been commoditized now. So if you can spend somebody else's money and put it at risk, that's generally the way you go. Essentially, if you can get a 25 to 75 gearing ratio on these sorts of things. So, you know, almost all projects in the offshore wind sector have been project financed, unless there have been the, the really risky ones at the early demonstration stage. Yeah. And, and so in order to do that, there is this additional process of going through bank finance and de-risking of, of projects and building. Can you put the my slide back up for a second? Um, yeah, I mean, how transferable are the, are the skills? Absolutely. Um, when I first came to Aberdeen, I think we had about 10, 15 people just in the environmental department. As somebody said earlier, it's like, oh, just give it to these guys. That doesn't exist anymore. So what I find myself doing, if you have a look at the, the little banner along the bottom, you've got the incremental improvements, you've got the flare management, et cetera. If, if, if I'm looking at uh, helping a, a company with their greenhouse gas emissions or some other problem, I don't know how to drill a well, so I'll go to the wells guys. I'll get these guys. I, you know, I don't know anything about logistics, so I'll go to the, the logistics guys, and I'll pull them in and I'll add it. I'll, I'll steer the ship, you know, I'll, I'll tell them what the regulations require, but I'll use their, um, their expertise in their domain so that we can get a much better product for the client at the end of it. So that's on the, the, the incremental improvement and, and the, you know, the, the major engineering improvements. So that's where we are at the minute, but we've also been in the, you'll see along at the right hand side there, step change decarbonisation, we've just finished a, a piece of work for SOIC and the Crown Estate where we looked at the uh, repurposing of uh, oil and gas infrastructure. So that's us taking our skills from our domain, oil and gas, right into the new world. So 100%, 100%. And I guess that's, a, that's an interesting point actually because you know when we look at, again going back to the idea of a mature oil and gas basin, uh, you know, it's, it's mature because it's got a lot of, uh, of equipment, pipelines, um, structures, uh, both subsea and, and platforms uh, that are there, you know. So uh, to delve in, and I guess, you know, this would be an interesting point for yourself, but also to the rest of the panel, you know, do you see a potential and an opportunity with the existing infrastructure that's already in a mature basin like the North Sea that can help enable or uh, uh, deliver, you know, sort of uh, more economic um, uh, renewable energy? That's a very nuanced question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nicky was on the project team. Um, just because you can do things doesn't mean to say that you should. No, there's, we, we, we did the gap analysis. So we, 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 we spent three months looking at this stuff, uh, looking at the... the uh, the real estate in the, the northern North Sea, you know, the, the larger platforms, then in the southern North Sea, the new East. But we also looked at the, um, obviously, the, you know, there's the pipelines out there. But you take that a little bit broader and you start looking at the, the port and the harbour infrastructure. So the building blocks are there. But in, 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 I guess, back to the Lego analogy, what order do you put them in? So do you go down the blue hydrogen route? perhaps, or the green hydrogen, it should blue be onshore or offshore? Do you spend your money repurposing the kit offshore? I have doubts, but... <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it depends on how you look at this stuff. So, yes, the material is there, but how, how, how do you go about it? Um, yeah, how do you go about it? But the, the, I mean, the other building blocks that we looked at as well weren't just physical. We looked at the... Uh, let's call them systems of management, you know, management systems that have grown up around oil and gas, the competencies, all of those things are there and eminently transferable. So it's not just the hard materials, but the, you know, the softer stuff. Yeah. The, so like you've got the balance yeah. of the hardware, the infrastructure and, uh, yeah. and, the, and the supply Absolutely, chain and yeah. skills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody else on the panel, any other thoughts on that? Um, well, just a quick one, really, if you trying to reuse that infrastructure and the hardware, I'd say that. I mean, Simply Blue don't have any assets in the North Sea at the moment, um, but, but 
if we did, then I, I don't know if we'd want to be extending them and repurposing them beyond that life. I think um, so when the most recent old downturn happened, um, the, the name of the game was life extension. Um, and it was all about, you know, pushing those OM O and M activities um, to the limit. And I think if you're taking old infrastructure and trying to repurpose it, then you're going to start from day one with those sorts of issues and those sorts of challenges. And I, I think that's in, an increased OPEX earlier on in a project that you probably don't need and don't necessarily want. So, I, I'm, you know, I wouldn't rule it out, but I would say that's um, a key challenge for me, I would think. Okay. Fairly agnostic in terms of whether you should do these things, um, you know, quite often the market makes these decisions as, as they progress. But one of the things from early studies, at least, is if you do a bottom-up capex at looking at repurposes an oil and gas asset for, say, hydrogen production, then highly expensive. There's a massive risk case there. And and then there's, there's doubts around whether some of those pipelines can or can't be used and what's the sweet spot for it. However, if you then add on the fact that all of these things are staring down the barrel of a massive decommissioning liability, potentially into the billions of dollars, if you can offset that by 10, 15, 20 years, then the opportunity cost that comes alongside not spending a billion dollars or billions of dollars, then that changes that financial question quite significantly. So I don't think that question question is fully answered and, yeah. and we will continue to see it being asked in, in, until we kind of resolve that differential between the two of, of that decommissioning piece and is there an alternative use for this? I think people have stopped asking us now, can we put a substation on it? So that's something at least. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, yeah, there's some pretty specific examples, I suppose, where it's been proven to be valuable, but on the whole, it's a case-by-case -case assessment. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's no sort of yes or no answer, I don't think, to that one. Yeah, I guess that's the reality of it, you know, and I think it's about being open-minded and identifying where the potential opportunities are, but recognising that uh, there's always going to be um, a one-size-fits-all. So, right, so it's, it's, uh, it's open up to the floor uh, question time. So we've got uh, four stellar people here, uh, key in their expertise. So I'm, I'm assuming there's going to be lots of questions. If there's anyone, raise your hand. There's mics ready to go around. Oh, we've got one question at the back. Just about. That's it. Come on. So, Mark Ross from James Fisher. Just, just a quick question. Like, we have always fixated on uh, like floating wind and wind energy, but solar panels. You know, what I mean, that gives us more energy efficiency. You know, what I mean, we get more energy output from a solar panel than we do from a wind turbine. Especially if you're building a field of them. You know, you got floating solar now. That's a concept that's probably going to know, be pushed forward um, in the near future. And the raw materials to build, you know, the solar farms is a lot you know, cheaper than it is to, well, easier to get as well than it is for the wind turbines. So why, so my question is, why are we so fixated in, the, in, in offshore wind and not the solar, when the, the benefits swing in favor of the solar? Well, you're right, I should quit my job and go home. Um, <laughs> No, I think um, I think it's well. The title of this session is about powering diversity, and I think you know diversity is is good for business. Uh, it's good for for your your um, energy economy. You can't rely on any one source of energy. Um, uh, you know, uh, during the winter we won't have any solar, um, and the long term storage challenges if you do go down that route are you know, horrific. So yeah. It, it's all about diversity, essentially. Um, I then put another point onto onto your um, onto your question. There is then why would we go from fixed to floating when it's so much more expensive? Well, for for me, there's there's two points there. There's the the slightly obvious one where we can go further offshore and into deeper waters, um, and then but thereby um, increasing the yield. Um, but also, hopefully, then pushing the technology to, to reduce that LCOE, um, hopefully, touch wood. Um, but then the thing that we've missed out on with, with fixed that I hope we're 
going to achieve with floating uh, as a country it is really about securing that that supply chain. Um, yeah, we've slightly missed out, and it was this was heavily um, commented upon on the on the last session, but more focused on the actual skills. Um, it wasn't so much about um, the supply chain and the economy, but it's the same sort of language there. That it, it's there's a very delicate um, offering from from floating is it, that you know we we can improve the local economy, but floating being such an easy easily exportable technology, um, we've got those challenges from overseas markets. Who if, you know, if we don't build the foundations here, then they'll be built somewhere else. Um, so it's. The, the value really in, in offshore wind and specifically in floating, um, when, when you put it beside solar, is the fact that there is this potential for it to really boost the local economy. Or I, I think the, there was a word, I can't remember who said it now, but they use the word rejuvenate. And I, I think that's, that's quite appropriate. Yeah. I think there's a question of capacity on that one as well in terms of, you know, show me whereabouts in Scotland you could build 25 gigawatts of solar which is the opportunity that's coming from, from the other side. But I mean, there are definite benefits to solar and its, it's profile matches really well with things like battery storage. So it's, it's certainly not to be written off, but there are, there are easier ways in which to generate large amounts. And that's why uh, offshore wind is now the cheapest way to build new generation. Still has issues in terms of curtailment and in terms of storage, et cetera, and these sorts of things. It's not the savior of, of absolutely everything. And, as Tom was saying, that's why we're talking about diversified um, ecosphere when it comes to energy. So solar's there to play its part, and I think it will be a strong part of the future. Maybe know that much around Aberdeen, but you never know. Um, but it's yeah, it's a capacity piece. If you're trying to do your best to displace as much of um, the carbon from the grid as possible, then you need to be able to build that scale, particularly when you're dealing with intermittency. So even when you do have periods of um, low wind days, then it's not going to be low wind absolutely everywhere. So there's additional generation coming on board, whereas, you know, there are definitely days when it, the sun never shines anywhere in Scotland and that lasts a while. <laughs> that, that, that's very true. Um, the same could be said about wind, but one constant we do have is tidal. So if you go down to the, the southeast of England, you know, I, I, I know because we do diving and stuff like that, there's a lot of downtime because the divers can't go in, the ROVs can't go in because the tides are so strong. So what's the projection for the United Kingdom going to get into tidal? How much are we going to invest in that area? Um, I, I'm going to answer that very quickly because I'm not an expert on tidal, but my understanding really is that um, although there are specific locations where it is a great solution, um, you still need to, to build up, you still need that investment in the industry to be able to get the solutions to the required return of investment. Um, once you get to that position and you've you've got these projects dotted around the UK and in, in, you know, in their specific locations where they work really well, the trouble is, is it's, it's not a well exportable technology. Um, Britain's quite niche in, in the terms of it, its um, tidal currents and its waves. Um, we've got um, a great opportunity to, to capitalise on that, um, but unlike floating wind, the the export market isn't quite there. Um, I don't know if anyone's got any more detail to add up to that. I guess the, you know, the, the, the beauty of offshore wind, or maybe not the beauty, but the beauty of wind in general is that the LCOE can be pushed down by sort of global investment. Um, you know, as Tom was saying, the tidal, tidal resource works very well in specific regions. You know, you look at the Pentland Firth, for example, um, really good, lots of water movement, um, but it, the distribution costs are astronomical to get that into the grid. Um, and similarly, places like Swansea, different technology, but again, high distribution costs. And does that trans does that export well acro across the world? I don't know. I guess the government are investing. There is a CFD round for tidal. Um, that should help drive down the cost. Is that replicated globally? I don't know if there's, if there's other countries that are doing similar processes. But if there are, then that is going to significantly drive down the cost to help it become more competitive with offshore or onshore wind, I guess. Um, but it needs... You know, it needs more than just Scotland to, to, to bring that cost down, definitely. I mean, for me, I don't, I, you know, I can't comment, comment, comment on uh, which, which technology is the best, but that, that, that's, that's the whole point of this. And data is there to, you know, to, to help people make decisions. Uh, and you come back to, you know, a diagram like that. It's uh, 
which is the best, you need to prove it through you know, some sort of comparative assessment or bat assessment or, or whatever, so you can stack up the, the, the economic benefits, environmental benefits, etc. but in a, in a robust manner, so that uh, the financiers, the regulators, the decision makers, um, yeah, they've got the information to make their decision on. So yeah, it comes back to data for us, verifiable. Okay, that's excellent. So, um, thanks for your question. Have we got any other questions in the audience? You're going to have to tie it up there, I think, John. We're, we're, we're nearly, <laughs> well, it looks like we've been getting the, the pro hook. So, listen, what I want to do is uh, take the opportunity to thank the panel and uh, for, for their, their, their wisdom, their input, uh, and their understanding. Uh, you, the audience, as well, to, for, for uh, again, listening and engaging for me, I think the whole point of this is the fact that, you know, when we talk about a mature base, and I think that's, that's, a, that's an old term and, and, and should be consigned to, to, to the bin, you know. What we have now in, in like this uh, UKCS is a very vibrant, uh, diverse energy system that has the opportunity and the potential to use the skills that have been generated over decades from, uh, from the hydrocarbon industry and really bring that into sort of the, the uh, renewable and uh, not necessarily alternative energy, you know, but, uh, but the new energy sources and, uh, and decarbonized energy. And, uh, and that, for me, again, creates a lot of enthusiasm and, uh, and a great appetite going forward. And going back to that skills piece, I think it's something that we have to make sure that we're reinvesting right down uh, from primary schools and that we're recognizing that, uh, that the energy industry isn't just about oil and gas. Uh, it's, in, it's inclusive of it, but it's, uh, but it's also very um, wide ranging and uh, it's going to need, you know, sort of uh, young engineers, young data scientists uh, and, and young people to come in in order to be able to drive that and uh, drive the solutions. So, again, I just want to thank the panel and uh, thank you as an audience.